and through other forms of, of uh, antiviral protection, especially the masking that all of you all are, are doing today. So I'm going to go through some, some pretty unpleasant, unhappy stuff, but the broader context is that we are in control and we can make things better. So how did I get uh, interested in Tom's River? Well, it started here on Long Island. You all see Long Island there. I don't have to explain what that is to you all, since we're here at Hofstra. Uh, and I was writing for Newsday as the environmental writer. And when you're the environmental writer at a place like Newsday that is suburbanized or urbanized, we don't have a lot of wide open spaces. And so people would constantly get in touch with me and what they would want to talk about is environmental health. They want to know how the environment is affecting their health. And specifically, I got asked a lot about cancer. Why is there so much cancer at the post office where I work? Why is there so much cancer on the block? What about at my school? And especially childhood cancer was, was so traumatic, as was breast cancer. There was a breast cancer activist movement right here on Long Island. It was a national movement, but it was it was at its most organized and intense right here on Long Island, and it still exists, even if it's not nearly as high profile as it used to be. And a big aspect of the breast cancer movement on Long Island was people wanted to know, why does Long Island have so much breast cancer? Uh, I was really interested in that question, too. So many people were interested in it, and there was so much political activism and also so much coverage by a lot of good reporters uh, and also by me. Uh, that something called the Long Island Breast Cancer Study Project was funded. And we all had high expectations for that piece of research. Unfortunately, it didn't really meet our expectations. It, it, it was funded uh, in a very political way. Uh, it wound up asking questions that were kind of obvious. Uh, it didn't do a lot of independent uh, environmental data collection. And in the end, what it found was really what we already knew, which is that Long Island has high breast, breast cancer rates, but they are not unusually high compared to other affluent suburban areas. So we know that the environment is an important cause of breast cancer and other cancers. But we don't know, we have no particular, no reason to think, based on scientific evidence, that there's something happening on Long Island that is not also happening in Montgomery County, Maryland, or Marin County, California, or other affluent suburban areas. So that was frustrating because we already knew that. Uh, and I felt like I had covered this so much, but I wasn't really giving my readers the information that they really wanted to know. Uh, and about that time, I heard about a really innovative piece of science, uh, scientific research, that was happening in Tom's River. I'm sure there are folks from New Jersey here. Anybody from Jersey? Raise your hand if you're from Jersey. No, oh, only a couple. Um, well, let me just tell you about Tom's River. It, it's sort of situated in between Philadelphia and New York, where that green star is. Uh, it's a place that has a very strong civic culture. It has a strong sense of itself. It's a place where there's amazing Little League. They've won the Little League World Series twice, and they have gone to the Little League World Series multiple times. There are parades all the time. Uh, the perfect day uh, in Tom's River is a parade for the Little League, uh, and that happens uh, multiple times every year. The, the main street in town uh, is called Washington Avenue, named for George Washington, but that was not sufficiently patriotic for the people of Tom's River, so they changed the name of the, of the street to the Avenue of Americanism, just to make sure people really got the point that this was an apple pie and baseball and Fourth of July kind of place. That's the sense that they had of themselves. And yet, Tom's River is also a place where this happened. This is a toxic waste site being uh, excavated right in the middle of town where thousands of barrels of toxic waste were dumped illegally, right under the noses of the people of Tom's River. You can see thousands of them. You can see they're, they're numbered. Here they're at more than 15,000. Ultimately, there were a few hundred thousand barrels of toxic waste buried in town. 
And Tom's River is also the place where some really terrifying things happened. There were headlines about a childhood cancer cluster, that too many kids were getting cancer, and about uh, pollution. There were angry meetings filled with hundreds of parents who were terrified at this news that they were reading that many an unusual number of children were dying in their community. So that scared me and also kind of fascinated me that somehow a place that identified itself as an all-American place where there were parades and Little League was also a place that would tolerate this right in the middle of their town. How did this happen? Uh, this book, Tom's River, was my attempt to try to make sense out of this apparent contradiction. And so I started digging into it, and I started really getting interested in the history of uh, the environment and cancer. And I learned about a guy uh, named William Perkin, who was sort of the, the Mark Zuckerberg of his day. He was a chemistry student at the Royal College of Medicine. Uh, and his professor, August von Hoffman, a very famous guy, said, you know what, uh, William, why don't you spend spring break trying to find a synthetic alternative to quinine, which was a, a special uh, medicine that could be made from the bark of a tree in Brazil, and it could be used to treat malaria. But it was very rare. It was hard to find and hard to, re hard to refine uh, quinine. And so von Hoffman said, you're my star student. Why don't you see if you can produce a synthetic version of quinine? And so he went to work doing that. And uh, ultimately, he was fooling around with a, a few different molecules. And he came up with one based on uh, aniline, a molecule of aniline, that really didn't quite work as a substitute, as a treatment for malaria. But it was beautiful. It was a gorgeous shade of pur purple sitting at the bottom of his test tube. And when he saw that purple, he saw his main chance. Uh, he quit college, just like uh, Zuckerberg would. Uh, he didn't really think about the consequences of what he was doing uh, in, in uh, dropping out of school. I'm not really advocating dropping out of school, by the way, guys. Uh, don't do it. Uh, but I got to say, for Perkin, it worked out because he became, uh, he, he opened his own chemical manufacturing company. He started making this purple dye, which he called uh, mauve or mauvine. And purple was not just any color. It was the color of royalty. It was the most fashionable color there was. That's Queen Victoria. Of course, we didn't have color photos back then. That's a colorized photo. But she loved wearing purple. Uh, she, her, her, uh, Princess Eugenie, who was much more fashionable than Queen Victoria, uh, wore purple almost every day. And so Queen Victoria wanted to look as beautiful as Eugenie, so she wore purple. Uh, and the reason that purple was the color of royalty, because it, like quinine, was really hard to find. You had to find a sea sna snail off the coast of Lebanon. That was the only way to get this beautiful shade of natural purple. And so most people couldn't wear purple clothes until Perkins started manufacturing it. Uh, and when he did start manufacturing it, he started making a lot of money, just like Zuckerberg. Uh, other people started to emulate, started to copy uh, Perkins' technology. Uh, this is a bunch of factories in Basel in the 1860s. Perkins did his work in 1858 and 59. In France and Germany and Switzerland, there was no patent protection. So they all stole uh, Perkins' technology, his recipe, uh, and created this vast in industry almost overnight. And those companies that started out making dyes, Seba, Bayer, BASF, all of them started off making aniline dyes. But before long, they had expanded into plastics, petrochemicals, all of these huge chemical companies that 150 years later, still exist or exist in some form. Some of them have merged into other companies. Uh, they all got their start making these synthetic dyes. But there was a dark side to this. Uh, this is the middle bridge in Basel. Basel is a beautiful city in Switzerland. Everyone should visit. But more than a century ago, 
Basel was an industrial sewer. It, it was a, a, a place that was the, one of the headquarters of uh, chemi the chemical industry around the world. And it generated a huge amount of toxic waste. People would take barrels of that waste. They would dump it off the bridge right into the Rhine River. Um, after a while, they started doing it at night because they knew that what they were doing was wrong. Uh, but they kept dumping. People who wore these products that were dyed, like stockings, had horrible rashes. Sometimes the, the stockings would melt on their, leg, on their legs, and yet they still wore them. Uh, this is a cartoon from Punch of a couple of skeletons uh, called the arsenic waltz. Arsenic, which we all know now is a poison, and people knew it was a poison back then too, it was also a key ingredient of the first synthetic green dyes, and people loved to wear green. Of course, the people who had it the worst were the, menu, were the, were the workers. Uh, industrial occupational settings are always where the highest exposures are. They had the toughest time of all. In the United States, the outpost of the early chemical industry, the dye industry, the most important was the uh, outpost was the Cincinnati Chemical Works in Ohio. Don't let anybody ever tell you that uh, toxic chemicals cannot cause cancer. Uh, if, if they do, point them toward the Cincinnati Chemical Works because there were horrendously high rates of bladder cancers and other specific cancers at this factory. They also were terrible polluters of the Ohio River. And eventually the public pressure on the Cincinnati Chemical Works just got too high. And so the Swiss owners decided they needed a new place to look around a new place to make dyes and plastics where they could do what they wanted with more privacy. Uh, they picked New Jersey. New Jer they picked a part of New Jersey that was pretty isolated in the, in the central Pine Barrens uh, in the town of Tom's River that at that time was a very small place. Here's a photo of the factory when it was uh, at its peak in the 60s and 70s. You could see it was a, a sprawling uh, complex making dyes, plastics, other petrochemicals. It had 1,300 employees at its peak, which made it the largest private employer at that time uh, between Newark and Philadelphia. Um, it had a $35 million payroll. That was a lot back then. And it produced 3 billion pounds of dyes and plastics, approximately. I had to try to figure that out uh, during the peak years of manufacturing. So that's a lot, but that wasn't really the main thing that, it, that this factory produced. What this factory produced in highest volume was waste. 40 billion gallons of wastewater, 200,000 drums of toxic waste approximately. I had to try to construct that number. The manufacturing process was incredibly wasteful. Uh, generated massive amount of waste. And so you could see why Sibigaygi, why the Swiss owners of this plant wanted privacy to do all this. You might ask yourself, how could that happen right in the middle of town? Especially when so many people at Tom's River were working at the plant. It was the dominant employer. The answer is that things were going well in Tom's River from a wealth perspective. For a while, as you can tell from that circle, red circle, uh, Ocean County, New Jersey, where Tom's River is situated, was the fastest growing county in all, one of the fastest, one of the five fastest growing counties in the United States in the 60s and 70s. Housing prices were going up, up, up. There was suburban sprawl. There were many problems associated with, with growth. Uh, yet, things were going so well that nobody really wanted to ask too many questions about what was happening in town. Here's a map of the town, and you know the overarching method, uh, message was, nothing to worry about here, nothing to see here. There was nothing to see here at the factory site. All those dark splotches were uh, dump sites within the factory property. No worries, nothing to see here. Even when the factory's own drinking water started to taste really bad, 
the factory owners decided, okay, no problem, we'll just dig new wells, upgrade it, uh, and not fix the groundwater pollution that had tainted our own wells. Nothing to worry about down here in the Toms River. One of the reasons the factory picked the spot that it did is that it was right next to a river, more like a creek. You know, there were points where so much uh, liquid waste was going to the Toms River that it represented almost half of the river flow was uh, wastewater from the plant. So tremendous volumes of waste, all happening right in the middle of town. There were fish kills. There's a place up here closer to the factory called the Black Lagoon uh, where nothing could live. Most seriously of all, there were water wells that delivered the public water supply all around town. They were located on the river, the river that was terribly polluted. There were one set of wells here, uh, the Holly Street wells, where they would essentially vacuum up, those wells would vacuum up the wa river water, which would penetrate through the sandy banks, and then be distributed all over town. After a while, just as the factory's water started to taste funny, water in the town started to taste funny. And there was a little bit of pressure for the first time on the water company uh, and on the chemical company to do something about this. So the factory said, no problem, we'll build a pipeline and we'll dump it in the ocean. And so that's exactly what they did. You can see the pipeline ran all the way from the factory out across Barnegat Bay onto the, the, the Jersey Shore uh, between Ortley Beach and Lavalette, and the pipe opened up into the ocean. Because back then, they used to say the solution to pollution is dilution. So let's just dilute the waste. There was also a big problem at a whole nother place uh, in town. The other well field uh, was, happened to be next to another dump site, a farm where the farmer needed some money and he agreed to let a, a corrupt trucker dump several thousand deteriorating barrels of toxic waste in the back of his farm. That quickly entered groundwater, that waste entered groundwater. It was vacuumed up by the parkway well fields, uh, parkway wells, and then there was a whole nother round of drinking water contamination now, instead of the 60s, and, uh, it, was, it was the 70s and 80s, thanks to the parkway wells. Then there were a couple of leaks in the pipeline. There was some attention to that. There were bulldozers that had to be called to fix the leaks. The soil was black and s smelled badly. And yet, the consensus still held that this plant was good for the town, Everything was fine. We don't need to know what we don't need to know anything more than that. Even when in the heart of the town itself, a number of families, a number of children in who, who lived in the heart of town developed cancer. So this is Linda Gillick. Uh, she former teacher, very uh aggressive person, very, uh, uh, takes no guff from anybody, including from me, uh, and very pa uh, passionate and very loving about her family. And her son, Michael, was diagnosed with neuroblastoma when he was just a few months old. And his case was uh, considered fa uh, to be a fatal case. They told, the doctors told the Gillicks, you might as well buy a coffin now because it will be hard psychologically to buy a coffin after he dies. Why don't you prearrange his funeral now? Because he's not going to live to past age one. Well, that, they were wrong about that. Michael Gillick is still alive. He's in his 30s now. He's a very brave, intelligent guy. But his life has been hell. He's been through multiple uh, cancer surgeries. He's had horrible side effects, as, as you might expect, associated with uh, chemotherapy and radiation treatment. And in the course of getting that treatment, they visited a lot of hospitals in Philadelphia and predominantly in Philadelphia and New York City. And it seemed like every time Linda and Michael went to uh, a hospital, 
Linda would meet other families from Tom's River. And she thought there was too much cancer in town. And so she started making her own map. Epidemiology is the science of disease over space and time. It's usually conducted by professionals. We're all learning about epidemiology these days in the context of the pandemic. But it can work for chronic diseases like cancer too. It's much more difficult, but it can be done. Linda started doing that on her own. She started making a cancer map. She put push pins in the side of her door, uh, her, her uh, living room door. Uh, and she became convinced that something was happening in Tom's River, and she asked the health department to do something about it. The health department said, no, we, we, we don't see any evidence of this. We're not going to look into it. They weren't just being lazy. Uh, they weren't just being denialists. There were also some good reasons to think why cancer clusters uh, are problematic. These are all things, these are all pieces written by people I know, in some cases friends of mine, highly skeptical about cancer clusters. So why are people so skeptical about cancer clusters? And the reason is that we humans are really good at pattern recognition. We're actually too good at it. We tend to see patterns when they don't always exist. Uh, it's what the uh, neuropsychologists would call a heuristic, a shortcut, right? That's how we get through the day. We make assumptions, we put things together, sometimes based on inadequate evidence. It looks like these dots on this field are clustered. And if we could, oh, that looks like a cluster, that looks like a cluster, that looks like a cluster, that looks like a cluster. But actually, the dots on this field were generated by a random field generator, right? So it's a random distribution. There is no pattern here. It's just random. But it looks like a cluster. Epidemiologists have a name for that. They call it uh, Texas sharpshooting. Imagine there's a cowboy. He's a really lousy shot. He's just shooting wildly on the side of a barn. And then somebody's walking down the road that he wants to impress. So he grabs a can of paint. He looks to where the shots were sort of randomly distributed on the side of the barn. And he paints a target where most of the bullets happen to land. And he says, see, look, I was aiming there all the time. That's called post hoc uh, epidemiology after the fact. Uh, uh, epidemiological reasoning, it's a problem. So Linda Begulik, she might not have been right. There was a possibility uh, that what she thought was a pattern was not a pattern. And so the professionals were skeptical. They were not helpful. In addition, there was intense community pressure. Uh, things were going well in Tom's River. Nobody wanted to admit that something horrible might have happened in Tom's River and that they had allowed something so incredibly dangerous to occur in their own town. When Linda Gillick started to get some attention, she got horrible notes, like this one was stuck in her mailbox. The water's fine. The cancer cluster's probably a freak. Meantime, Ocean County will suffer this summer because you've scared away tourists and the home buyers and others. So at this point, it makes sense to just sort of stop and say, why does this happen? And especially in the context of the pandemic, why, when we know that vaccines work, when we know that masking and social distancing, of course, everything we know about airborne viruses tells us that, of course, they will reduce incidence. And yet, we deny it. Many of us do not want to confront that evidence. The same thing in, in Tom's River. Why were people so reluctant? to confront the evidence, the, the hard evidence of what was happening in their town. Well, it turns out there's a guy who has some really interesting thoughts about this. His name is uh, Dan Kahn, and he's a character uh, and a professor of law uh, at Yale University. And he's done a whole bunch of interesting experiments. Uh, if you want to learn more about Dan and his work, you can look at, you can go to culturalcognition.net. So what he did, he's trying to figure out why do people feel the way that they do? How do they decide how they feel 
about uh, science-related issues. So what he did is he polled a bunch of people, he, uh, and he asked them how they identify themselves politically. Are they liberal, liberal Democrats? Are they conservative Republicans? How do they see themselves? He also gave them a quiz about science, about how much do they really know about science, including climate science, because he was especially interested in attitudes about climate change. And then he asked a series of questions and wanted to sort of chart the responses. He asked, what gas do most scientists believe causes temperatures in the atmosphere to rise? Is it uh, helium, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, or, or radon? Well, I think, I hope uh, everybody in this room uh, and watching knows that it's carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas. And sure enough, the results he got showed that liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans tracked pretty closely. The more you knew about science, the more likely you were. Here's the axis for uh, scientific knowledge down here on the bottom. So the more you knew, uh, the more likely you were to get it right. That's great. And as journalists, that makes us really happy. As educators, and I'm an educator too, that makes us really happy. Because we like to think of our students as, uh, as empty vessels, right, and our readers. Uh, all we have to do is fill them up with the right information, with good information, good evidence, give them those, the skills to interpret that evidence, and they will be like computers. They'll assess that information and follow the weight of the evidence and get the answer right. Well, let's keep looking. Here's another question. Climate scientists think that the increase in CO2 associated with burning fossil fuels will reduce photosynthesis by plants, true or false? That's a little harder question. Actually, at least in the short run, the answer is, fa uh, is, is uh, false. It will actually increase photosynthesis by, by, by plants. Uh, there are lots of reasons still why we don't want all this excess CO2 in the atmosphere. And in the long run, plants will, plant life will be affected negatively too. But anyway, most people, again, got, you can see from the chart, most people got that question right. Whoops. But how about the third one? Okay. Climate scientists believe human-caused global warming will increase the risk of skin cancer. True or false? That's a, 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 an even harder question. The correct answer to that is actually false, at least, again, in the short run. When we're worried about skin cancer, we're actually focused on the ozone layer. Uh, so again, the more people knew, the, the more people got that question. The more people knew about science, the more science literate there were, the better they did. But then how about the fourth question? There is solid evidence of global warming due to human activities such as burning fossil fuels. Do you agree or disagree? Well, the overwhelming evidence is there, so the correct answer is agree. But look what happened. Liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans split very badly on this question. Liberal Dem Democrats were much more likely to get that, to agree with the weight of the evidence than conservative Republicans. That's bad, that polarization, but here's what's really horrible. The polarization increased the more people knew about science, the more conservative Republicans knew about science, and plenty of conservative Republicans know a lot about science, uh, the more likely they were to get this answer wrong. So that's terrifying uh, because it, it suggests that if an issue is culturally freighted, if it becomes a signifier, if it, if it has enough uh, it has properties that, that, that signal what group you belong to, you're gonna stop following the weight of the scientific evidence. Polarization and denial actually increase as knowledge increases. So, oh my God, it's not good enough just to tell people, here are the facts. Once an issue has become culturally freighted, that's what Dan Kahn found, and it's scary. So who does this? Oh, uh, and, and, and sometimes I happen to be a liberal Democrat, and we liberal Democrats will say, oh, the conservative Republicans, they're so irrational, right? Stop being so irrational. 
Kant's point is that it's not irrational at all. It's totally rational because they're following their peer group. And the cost of being alienated from your peers is extremely high. I grew up in Oklahoma. It was not easy to be a liberal Democrat in Oklahoma. I teach at NYU. It is not easy to be a conservative Republican at NYU. There are high costs to both of those positions. I don't know what the politics are here at Hofstra, but you know what it's like if you hold a belief that's contrary to your peer. There are high costs associated with that. So let's not say that these people are being irrational. They're being totally rational. Their sense of identification, the group that they identify with, very strongly believes that the weight of the evidence on the human contribution to global warming should be rejected. So who does this? Who has the power to turn what should be a matter of simple atmospheric physics into a cultural signifier? Guys like Rush Limbaugh, the late Rush Limbaugh, liberal Democrats too, Gwyneth Paltrow. If you look at Goop, there's a lot of non-evidence-based information on Goop. Social media profoundly has that influence. Uh, news media, op-eds, especially this guy, right? Let's put a mask on that guy. I mean... His unwillingness to wear a mask because he thought that it was made him look weak uh, cost untold numbers of lives. Why did he do that? Because he was assigning the parameters of what it means to be a Trump supporter, right? If you want to support me, you follow me, right? And once an issue has that kind of political salience, then it's very tough to embrace the actual evidence. That's where denialism comes from. So what, back to Tom's River, what finally changed in Tom's River? This is a, a nurse uh, at CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Lisa Bernazian. Uh, she's not there anymore, but she's a wonderful person. Uh, she kept seeing patients from Tom's River at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She kept going to funerals of, in Tom's River from patients that she got to know. When you're a nurse at a pediatric oncology ward, you really get to know your patients. It really bothered her. She said something to the doctors. I think there are a lot of kids from Tom's River that we're seeing here at Philadelphia Children's Hospital, which, by the way, gets patients from all over the world. Why do we have so many patients from Tom's River? They said, no, just do your job. Nothing, nothing, going ha nothing happening here, nothing to see. But it bothered her because she had forged, forged an emotional connection with these families. And her sister-in-law happened to work for the EPA. Uh, and her sister-in-law knew about an obscure federal agency, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, uh, that was actually interested in investigating uh, cancer patterns. And so an investigation happened a very cursory one. They decided to look at cancer rates in Tom's River compared to what would be expected in New Jersey based on the demographics in Tom's River, and they found there was seven times more cancer. And, uh, depending on what cancer you look, like, look, look for, 50%, seven times more. Every category that they looked at, there was more childhood cancer in Tom's River than expected. That was scary. But there was more to the story. I don't really have time to get into this slide, but if you, the incidence ratio just means where there are more cases than expected. You can see if it's above one, there were more cases than expected. But the 95% confidence interval is like a margin of error in a poll. And those margins of error were really wide. There was huge uncertainty. So yeah, it was highly suspicious that all standardized incidence ratios in Tom's River, it was known then as Dover Township, were higher than expected. But the state health department concluded, because of the small number of cases, it's not possible to conduct studies to determine whether this is a real cluster or just a random event. 
in other words, what Michael Berry did was he punted, right? And if you're a football fan and you follow the Giants or the Jets, you know they do a lot of punting, uh, at least the last few years. Uh, worse, in addition to not acting on the information, the state health department decided to keep it a secret. That's not a good thing. Because when you keep something a secret and then the information comes out, people freak out. And that's exactly what happened at Tom's River. A newspaper reporter, through a whole fascinating series, sequence of events, found out about it, wrote some stories. The entire town really went, went nuts. Uh, there were, you couldn't get a bottle, bottled water in Tom's River, anywhere within miles of, of Tom's River for a period of months. Uh, there, were, there was a meeting at the high school where parents were so angry, they essentially took the state health commissioner hostage until she agreed to do an investigation, which she finally did. It took a really long time, seven years, almost as long as it took me to write this book. Uh, but sure enough, they found that there was a non-random uh, dose-response relationship between exposure to polluted air from the factory or polluted water from the Parkway Wells and rates of childhood leukemia. That almost never happens. It's really hard to do this kind of cancer epidemiology. It's so much easier to do the kind of infectious disease epidemiology that we're reading about every day with the coronavirus. Why? Because there are years can pass between the, an initial exposure to a carcinogen and the, a diagnosable tumor in your body. Whereas exposure to the coronavirus, as we know, could be a matter of hours before you show symptoms, or at least a few days. Uh, the families were compensated to some extent. The numbers in this headline aren't quite right. Uh, but depending on how you define the cluster, 80 or more young people in Tom's River likely lost their lives because of exposure to these compounds. So I ended the book not by, not in Tom's River, but by going to China. Why did I do that? Because the chemical industry is in China. First it went to Louisiana after it was chased out of New Jersey. Now, China is the site of most chemical manufacturing in the world. This is a Chongqing, that's Chongqing Children's Hospital that I visited, spoke to families and doctors who were very concerned about these exposures. Those jobs are starting to leave China now as China uh, uh, becomes a more uh, mature society and an environmental consciousness increases in China. They're going elsewhere. Where will they go? Indonesia, Africa, those jobs are, are moving on just as they moved on from Tom's River once people realized what was finally happening in their town. So the question is, can this cycle be broken? Are we just caught in this endless trap from Basel to Tom's River to Chongqing? I think we are not caught. I think that it is quite possible to act on the evidence and get good results because I've seen it happen multiple times. We're seeing it happen right here with the pandemic, far too slowly, but we are seeing that public health interventions work. They work, and they worked in Tom's River too. This is a chart of leukemia incidents in children compared to the state average, and you can see that in the 80s and the 90s, Tom's River was almost always above the statewide average. But then, after public health interventions, after the air emissions from the, from the plant ended, after the parkway wells were finally filtered properly, leukemia rates fell. Wow, what do you know? We're not just fated to these seemingly intractable problems we can actually act on information and make things better. So what do we do? How can we actually make things better? 
I mean, I think maybe the most important thing that we can do is to think really hard about our own biases and those of your, our own information sources. And we should be willing to change our minds. Changing your mind is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of intelligence. It's a sign that you're actually paying attention. Scientists change their minds all the time, and people find that frustrating. They say, well, why are you giving us mixed messages? Well, that's because the evidence changes over time. And sometimes there are disagreements on interpreting the evidence. That's a sign of the strength of the scientific process, not weakness. Related to that, we all have to get used to the idea of uncertainty. You know, we deal with uncertainty in our lives all the time. We get in a car, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, right? But we decide, you know what, it's worth it to me to take this drive, even though I don't know for sure how things are going to turn out. Epidemiology is all about probability. It's about playing dice, right? Playing cards. If you know how to play poker effectively, well, you're not going to make money in Vegas necessarily, but you'll, be, you'll do better uh, playing against people who don't know, who don't understand the odds. Uh, so we all have to be smart and understand that by following the weight of the scientific evidence, we're going to have better lives, even if every single individual outcome is not going to be what we want. There are still going to be people who are, there are still going to be breakthrough cases if you're vaccinated. There are still going to be people who are super strict about masking, and yet uh, they come down with COVID. These things are going to happen, but we have to be smarter than that. We have to think of the big picture, and the big picture is about probabilities. It's about playing the odds. And for those of you who, like me, call themselves environmentalists, we have to be thoughtful environmentalists not just reflexive opponents. We have to acknowledge that economic growth sometimes comes at environmental cost and environmental protection sometimes costs, uh, hurts the economy. We have to be real about those trade-offs and we have to make wide-eyed, wide uh, open-eyed, clear-eyed decisions uh, about how to handle these issues. And if you go into business, you're going to industry, you need to recognize that you are not going to be able to keep information from your public anymore. You can't. Because information in a digital environment wants to be free. And the whole lesson of the last few years is that it's a hell of a lot harder to keep secrets than it used to be. So instead, you, if you're in the, in the business world, you need to provide transparency. You need to provide context. If you don't, that information is going to get out and somebody else is going to provide a context that you don't like. And if you're in government, it means that you need to take your oversight job seriously. And if you're a voter, you need to fund oversight agencies seriously. We often are kind of not unserious uh, in the way that we fund environmental protection. And finally, all of us as individually, we have to rise to the obligation of what it really means to be a citizen. That means paying attention. It means thinking. It means reading a newspaper. They still exist, newspapers, you know? And many of them still do an excellent job. And if we don't, we're going to wind up with results that we don't like. I think one thing we've learned over the last four or five years is uh, that a lot of things that we took for granted, we cannot take for granted. We, democracy doesn't run by itself. It depends on us. And storytelling can help too. Who would have thought that a book about toxicology and epidemiology could actually be a New York Times bestseller? It barely was. There it is, number 20th on the list. But for the rest of my life, I could say, okay, I wrote a bestseller. It uh, can win prizes. It can get translated into Chinese. I felt really good about that. It can even get made into a movie, maybe. That's Danny DeVito. He liked the book, and he has the rights right now. He's from New Jersey. We hope someday it'll be a, a movie. We'll see. But the point is that for those of you who are in the room that are aspiring journalists and those of you who are watching, 
telling stories, true stories empathetically in narrative form can change the world in small but significant ways. You can do that. You have that power. It doesn't have to be this way. Climate change is not uninfluenceable. We're not stuck with portable morgue trucks in New York City. We don't have them anymore in New York City. Why? Because we started paying attention to the evidence. We don't have to bury our children and create memorial gardens for them, like this one in Tom's River. We can actually do something about it. It's within our power. Whether you're a journalist, whether you're in business, whether you're a stay-at-home parent, whoever you are, being an engaged citizen and thinking hard about risks and benefits and following the weight of the evidence, all of these things can make a difference. Thanks for listening. It should be working. No. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to thank Dan. Um, I had no idea, by the way, that when uh, I sent all you guys here that we were going to get a civics lesson. Uh, <laughs> but I certainly am glad to hear all the things he says about journalism, especially for those of you in ethics. This is what we do. Uh, anyway, fascinating. Uh, and I'm glad that you tried very hard not to be discouraging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... If anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to come and ask. Oh, no, Peter, I, I think. Oh, that's I, your mic. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can. Oh, you can? Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Hi, first of all, oh, you can't hear me. Hi, first of all, thank you. Um, how uh, significant do you think if we took more diligence in our environment, would the coronavirus be impacted? Yeah, well, we already know the answer to that question, right? What has happened to coronavirus rates and why? It's always hard to know for sure exactly when you have a multifactorial uh, change. It's hard to know which factor singly causes the change. But we, ought, we have a few completely compelling pieces of evidence. And that is, we can compare from country to country vaccination rates and, and death rates. And we see that there is a very direct relationship between vaccination rates and death rates. We are still losing 1,500 people a day in this country. That is higher than most European countries. That is higher than most Asian countries. Our vaccination rate is improving, especially now the last few weeks that more jobs have been mandated. Uh, to, that you, know, you can't go to work unless you, unless you vax. And so now that we know that, we're seeing some uh, further increases in vac vaccination rates in the US. And yet, overall, our vaccination rate is not as good as other industrialized countries. So really, what other evidence do we need? We know that many people died who need, need not have died. Uh, and that if we had been smarter about, especially about uh, social distancing and masking early on, and then later, if we had had much better vac vaccination compliance before the Delta variant, we would have seen far fewer deaths. So I think that the answer is pretty clear, that we have a lot of power over, over how, what, what has happened here. And while we're doing better now, many people died unnecessarily. I don't think there's any doubt of that. So does like pollution affect it? No, um, not really. Those are two completely separate problems. But my point is 
that the denialism that occurred in Tom's River and that still occurs when people are skeptical about whether pollution can affect health is similar to the denialism that has kept people from taking sensible steps to protect themselves from the pandemic. Thank you. Hi, um, I just kind of wanted to hear your opinion more about the kind of like the political denialism, especially with um, the QAnon theory that Trump is still running the country. Right. Um, do you have like any, yeah, um, opinions or knowledge about like the psychological effects of that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I just want to, want to, before I answer that question, I just want to say one more thing about this question of pollution and the virus. There is a little bit of evidence that people who uh, are immunocompromised due to environmental exposures are more at risk from the virus. So in that sense, there is a relationship, but it's an indirect relationship. Uh, yeah, QAnon, <laughs> what can be said? Uh, so there are a few, few things that were, are happening with sort of these hardcore denialist delu delusional uh, people, and one of them is that given the communication system as it exists now, where everyone is a publisher on social media, where there are no barriers or remarkably few barriers to exchanging information, whether it's true or false, that conspiracy theorists who before thought of themselves as sort of isolated now realize, oh my gosh, there, are, there are, this is awesome, there are lots of other people who are as delusional as me, and they, they take strength in that. The other thing that is strength and confidence, uh, and that is a change, right? That's a change in the media system that has been good in certain ways, but it has been terrible in in some ways, affirming folks who don't follow, who aren't reality-based. The other thing that we know from the work of Dan Kahn, who I mentioned, and others, is that these opinion leaders who draw the lines and say, if you're on this side, you're on my team, but if you believe this, you're not on my team, they have tremendous power and authority. I'm not expecting you know any kind of sort of bravery from Donald Trump or or, or his other 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 leaders uh, other sort of group definers like him but if we ever got it it's likely that it would have a significant impact and we can already see that from certain folks like folks on Fox News when Sean Hannity started talking about the importance of vaccination it actually made a difference right so we know that folks who have credibility in a community and then speak up as leaders can have a huge impact. So that's a potential positive. Another area of hope, I think, is young people, like many, many of you who are here in the audience. We know, the social science is, is pretty clear that young people are still open-minded, largely open-minded. But once you get to be in your mid to late 20s, and certainly when you're as old as me, this idea of changing your mind or rethinking who you are, what your identity is, becomes much less likely, much more difficult. So that's one of the reasons that I'm an educator, is that I think it's really important to try to talk to young people and talk to them about the importance of evidence-based thinking. Because you guys are still open-minded. It's a wonderful gift that you have that's superior to those, uh, your parents or, or me, in, in that you're still thinking, you're still figuring out who you are. Uh, and that is an area of great hope. And that's why, by the way, I think that many folks who are not evidence-based, who are not uh, necessarily reality-based, are really upset about uh, high school education and secondary and uh, college education because they see that their children don't necessarily share 
their unscientific beliefs. So I feel good about that in a way. Uh, it, 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 it makes me feel good about the future. I definitely think that your generation, the college genera student generation today, you are more tolerant, mo more open-minded, more even science-minded, even if you're not explicitly a science lover, you're more evidence-based, whether you realize it or not. And I, I take a lot of hope in that. So I think there are going to be a lot fewer Q and honors uh, in the next generation than there were in the last generation. Thank you. This may be a bit complex, but um, how would you go about trying to track an illness in a town with already high denialism? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult, right? I mean, one of the problems with public health in this country is that it's not very well funded, right? So we don't do a lot of surveillance. Surveillance sounds scary, but what it really means is looking at all this data that we collect and seeing, gosh, is there, a lot of, is there a lot of illness in a place? Instead, the way that we do public health investigations typically is that we wait for a community to holler enough. Uh, we, we wait for people to raise enough hell, and then we say, okay, we, I guess we'll have to look into that. So that's totally backwards, uh, and it, it's a little bit like, uh, the difference between being a fire inspector and a fire marshal. A fire inspector inspects the house to make sure that things are safe. A fire marshal is the person that goes in after the house is burned down and tries to figure out why it's burned down. We really need more fire inspection and less fire marshals. If we did that kind of surveillance, uh, if we looked at data, then it, would, it, it wouldn't be so important to build this community consensus uh, before we actually started looking into what might be happening uh, in, in a particular place. And we also have to acknowledge, you know, Tom's River was a very white uh, community, reasonably affluent community. It was unusual in that way. Uh, most of the worst environmental conditions occur in communities of color communities that are uh, impoverished, communities that don't have good access to politicians and don't really necessarily have good understanding of the public health system because they're really busy you know, trying to get through the week. So this is a problem too. It's a big problem. Uh, and it's why we need to be much more proactive in our approach instead of waiting for somebody like Linda Gillick, who you know went through hell for years before she was finally able to get the attention to this problem that the town deserved. She's an environmental considered an environmental hero in town now, at least in some part, in some parts of town. Uh, but it was a long time coming. So the problem that you outline, this problem of denialism, is really hard to crack. It's really hard to crack. And uh, sometimes it has to come from journalists. Sometimes it has to come from other opinion leaders. Sometimes it really should come from a proactive government, which we really don't have right now. Thanks for your question. Journalism ethics students, as well as uh, advanced students here, advanced reporting students here, and that question of when journalists should be reporting on cases like this, um, in part because you have state officials, you have federal officials who are denying it or saying there's no evidence there, and yet you're seeing the anecdotal evidence, you're creating the narrative uh, as a journalist. So you start reporting on it, and in this case, it really only it, there was Linda Gillick, and then it really only came to the fore when journalists got involved and started reporting on it. So, what are, what what are you, what's your sense on the ethics of reporting on on a case like this where the findings aren't definitive, you know, aren't scientifically proven, but you have the narrative and you have what appears to be anecdotal evidence? 
Right. That's such a good question. I can see why you're why you're a good teacher. Um, and it, it's something that I talk to my grad students, my science jour journalism grad students about all the time. Because many of these communities, because we don't do good public health in the United States still, uh, in, in the main, we don't, we aren't aggressive about looking for problems before they exist. Because many of these problems exist in disadvantaged communities, communities of color that don't have access to power, for all of those reasons, it, it is, it's kind of a trap uh, that uh, in these communities, they feel like something is happening, but it, they don't have hard evidence. Why don't they have hard evidence? Because no one has looked. So that's where journalists often come in. And what I tell my grad students is the way to handle that situation is not to blow off a story just because there's no hard evidence. But the goal is to report that story, but fully contextualize it. So you don't ignore it just because there, the scientific evidence is not there, but you don't pretend that the scientific evidence is there when it isn't. So what I have done in my own reporting and what I tell my students to do is to, yes, talk to all those people. Explain to readers that absence of data, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? So you follow what that means? That just because you don't have the data doesn't mean that the data doesn't exist. At the same time, we can't pretend, we don't want to present a story as convincing scientifically when it is not. So the way to handle it is to report the story in depth, but also being completely honest about the lack of hard evidence. Sometimes when that happens, enough people will be concerned that the government will step in and start looking. Sometimes they won't. But either way, you as a journalist will have fulfilled your obligation to reflect reality as best you can. Blowing off a story is rarely the right choice, uh, especially when you recognize that, these that this often happens in communities that do not have access to the power structure. What happened to the company? Uh, the company, <laughs> uh, CBS, uh, let's see, it, it spun off its uh, chemical, uh, it sold its, its chemical uh, operations to BASF, which is the largest uh, chemical company in the world. It still exists. Uh, as I said, that, this kind of manufacturing is pretty much gone from the United States. It uh, happens almost exclusively in China. But China is also beginning to crack down on uh, heavy chemical production. And, and so it is starting to move elsewhere. There's a lot of Chinese investment in Africa. And I would not be surprised if we see a serious move of the chemical industry into Africa uh, over the next 10 years. I guess mine's kind of like a two-parter. Um, where do you see like policy going to disrupt this? Um, uh, clearly a very capitalist, um, yeah, in the negative sense, um, reaction uh, to it just affecting the environment and um, our um, citizens of the world. And then also um, how would we do that internationally? So kind of stopping it in um, America to start with, but how would we stop the chemical companies internationally? Yeah, that is, that is a really difficult problem. <laughs> we, 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 reg we don't regulate uh, the behavior of individual companies uh, globally, at least with rare exceptions. Uh, and honestly, uh, given the standard of living in some of the places where the chemical industry operates, you might even be able to make an evidence-based argument that they're better off with the factory than without the factory, you know? Uh, and so it, it becomes really problematic. I do think that consumers in the United States and Europe and Japan and other post-industrial societies 
can definitely send messages through consumer boycotts and through their, their buying choices. I don't have high confidence that that's really likely to make a huge difference. What I am excited about uh, is green chemistry, right? So the, the chemistry that I described that happened at Tom's River was so incredibly wasteful. It, it was so inefficient and the, pro the pollution itself was so damaging. We now uh, have the ability to manufacture much more cleanly. Uh, and there are definitely things happening in terms of investments in green chemistry in the U.S. and Europe that mean that next generation manufacturing in, in post-industrialized countries is going to be vastly cleaner than what happened in Tom's River in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. I am less optimistic of that happening in the developing world, and I just, I wish I had a, sort of a super positive response on that, but I, I don't. I, I think that that cycle is likely to continue at least for a while longer. Well, there is one, here's one positive. Um, one of the things that happened in China that really took hold over the last 10 or 15 years is, is the internet, of course, is uh, aggressively controlled. It's a totalitarian country, China, and and they sense the power of the internet and they exercise strict control. But individual Chinese are very clever at finding ways to get around that. And they share information in ways that Linda Gillick in her era never could. So there's much more knowledge about what's happening in various communities uh, than there ever was in the 70s and the 80s in the United States. And for that reason, China is actually moving faster for all its problems, is moving faster to regulate its chemical industry than uh, the United States did uh, a half century ago. Why? Because information cannot be constrained. That's what I was trying to say before. In a digital environment, it's just a lot easier to find out about stuff. And even in a totalitarian society that's happening in China, uh, and it's a, it's a positive thing. And I feel like even as the chemical industry moves on to its wherever its next spot will be, in general, conditions will be somewhat better for the simple reason that everyone has access to information, almost everyone, in a way that they never used to have. Thank you. So you mentioned that it took you about seven years to finish the book. So I, I just want to know, what was one of the most difficult things about finishing the book? And seven years is a long time. What made you persevere and finish? Yeah, so seven years is a long time. Um, it was difficult for multiple reasons. Maybe one of the most difficult problems was that I really wanted to get a strong sense of, of how people in the town felt. And I ran into various problems in trying to reach the people who I really wanted to, to talk to in town. Uh, some of the families who were directly affected by the cluster, they just didn't want to talk about it anymore. And that was completely understandable. They wanted to move on from this horrible thing that happened in their lives. I totally understood that. Uh, other people thought that I was there to exploit their tragedy. Uh, they weren't happy with some of the press coverage that had, had come before. And so the more of, of that uh, that I heard, it, it took longer, but it also made me think, gosh, I've really got to get this right. Uh, and so fortunately, by then, I was not a news day anymore. I was a professor at NYU, and I had time. To, to do this the right way, and that's a precious thing. And I, another thing that was going through my head was that many of my peers, who were just as good journalists as, as I was, didn't have the luxury of time because they were still working at 
newspapers or whatever. And so I felt a little guilty about that. I decided, you know, I really wanted to do the best job I possibly could with this book because I had this, I was in this position of privilege. So for all those reasons, I took a really long time with this book. Uh, and I'm taking a really long time with my next book, too, uh, for the same reason. That plus I'm just slow. I'm a slow worker. Uh, and I'm committed to my students, and, and that, that takes some time, too. But I guess if there's a take-home message for, for you guys, especially as, as, as young people, if you're going to do something, why not just throw your whole, whole self into it? You know, why not do it with all of your passion? Uh, why half-ass it? Uh, you know, why not instead go for it uh, and try to make a real difference, whatever it is, whether you're a journalist or doing something else? And I've tried to t teach my students that, teach my own kids, my biological kids that. Uh, you know, I have, I've tried to sort of model that you know, in my own work. And I think that that is a good take home message for everybody. Why not do the best that you can possibly do, given the constraints that you're under? And that's what I tried to do with this book. And I never dreamed that it would be a bestseller or win, a pro win, a, win, win big prizes. I just thought I was writing a book that I was passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe there's a lesson there too. Maybe you'll be surprised if you throw your whole self into something. Maybe you'll be surprised and the, the result will outstrip your expectations. And it's exciting when that happens. It's, it's, it's been an exciting thing for me. Thank thanks, thanks for the question. I think that's probably. Oh, you're good. Here. I oh, here. oh, it's working. Yeah, I think. Thank you, Dan. I mean, especially for the last. Thank you very much. Uh, this was. This was really a powerful program, uh, and I hope that uh, I hope that you folks take a good deal from it as well. And I just wanted to thank you for coming, and for presenting this.